so the main event uh, today obviously is Airways 2 and I'm, I'm, A, I'm delighted to have been invited to chair this session but also delighted to introduce Jonathan Benger who many of you will know of course if you've ever heard of uh, Airways uh, and Jonathan's going to take us through the trial and then we're going to have a discussion about what it all means. Indeed. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, thank you very much for joining us in, uh, in London today. And apologies for those of you who've been on a coach for a long time from Yorkshire. Um, but it's great to have you here and it's great to see the room full of uh, paramedics and others uh, with an interest in research. Um, it's also unusual to find that you're in a conference venue that has its, has its main feature, an old wall. But we have one. There it is. Lovely. Uh, so, I'd like to echo some of Tom's uh, sentiments around uh, research and ambulance services. It's been a real pleasure to, to work with a lot of paramedics, uh, particularly our research paramedics, um, to deliver this study, and also with the ambulance services themselves, who have come on a huge distance in a very short space of time in order to get to a point where ambulance services are all grown up as research active uh, and research delivering organisations, uh, holding and administering large grants um, and successfully supporting research and training researchers. Um, and I think it's, you know, the paramedic profession has come on leaps and bounds um, through a variety of processes. And part of the establishing the legitimacy of, of a profession and its place uh, in healthcare delivery is around having a research base that's generated and delivered uh, and added to and supported by that profession. And one of my stated objectives within my career is to make myself uh, uh, obsolete uh, by replacing me uh, with paramedics uh, who are at least as good, if not better, at researching in ambulance services. It's the history of the paramedic profession is that, it, unfortunately, it has sometimes been overshadowed by the medical profession. Um, and uh, it's good to see paramedics establishing themselves as independent and effective healthcare uh, practitioners, um, and research is a part of that. And so uh, I want to stop being a doctor uh, running paramedic research, as it were. I want the paramedics to run paramedic research. And one of the great uh, things that Airways uh, 2 has done, and other studies like it, Paramedic 2 and others, uh, has been to support and develop an interest and a capability of research in paramedics, and I'm really pleased about that. What I'm going to do now is talk about Airways 2. Um, this is, as you know, a huge, a huge trial. Um, and as Tom said, it's an exciting time because we've had some major uh, randomised trials published in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest this year, uh, including the trial that was done in France and Belgium of bag mask ventilation uh, versus trachea intubation, and I'll talk a bit, a bit about that, I'm sure. Um, Henry Wang study, the PART study, which is an uh, American study uh, comparing the laryngeal tube uh, with um, trachea intubation, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, Paramedic 2, the huge and impressive study of adrenaline, which Tom will talk about later today, uh, and Airways 2. Airways 2 was funded by the National Institute for Health Research, um, and uh, that makes it independent research. We were not funded by industry, we're not funded by anybody other than the taxpayer, in effect, to deliver independent, high-quality research. You can trust the results of Airways 2. Um, the role of the professor is to stand and take the glory and the credit for the work that lots of other people actually do. Um, and uh, it, is, it is very difficult in some respects to acknowledge uh, 1,523 paramedics, for example, uh, who uh, recruited patients to our study. Um, but some of the key organisations are listed here. Uh, this is, as is the case for every large-scale research trial, always a huge collaborative effort. Um, and much of the skill of delivering research in the modern era is about coordinating skilled teams. Uh, it, research cannot be done in isolation, it cannot be done by an individual, it can only be done by large groups of people who have the skills uh, to deliver it. And so much of research delivery for me is about uh, managing large and complex teams spanning uh, multiple skill sets and multiple organisations. As you know, the outcome from cardiac arrest is very poor. 90% of patients do not survive to hospital discharge. Um, and we need to try and improve that. There are some key interventions that we know work but there aren't very many of them, and they're very simple interventions. The two things that absolutely reliably work is early chest compressions and early defibrillation if the patient is in a shockable rhythm. There's no other technology, no drug, and no other intervention that we know works reliably in all cardiac arrests in adults, uh, and that's a major problem. We're searching for interventions to improve outcome, uh, but we're also searching for interventions that don't get in the way of those two important things that we know work well. That's very good quality uh, chest compressions, and uh, early defibrillation. And 
in everything that I do I, in cardiac arrest, I always mention that because it's really, really important that we don't lose sight of that. And Cosmo mentioned that this morning as well in terms of that is the key uh, to survival in cardiac arrest. We really don't know what to do about the airway. Uh, we don't know how to manage the airway. We don't know what the best techniques are for airway management. It's unusual because it, a, the A in ABC is usually highly prioritised. In cardiac arrest, A is probably not, that, not as important as chest compressions and defibrillation. That's certainly the case. Uh, what is the best airway management strategy is unknown. There is a lot of observational data out there. And observational data uh, has a problem in that, in effect, you observe what happens to the patient, what airway they get, and then you observe what, what outcome they achieve. And the reality is, is that the problem with observational data is it's usually quite strongly confounded confounded by indication, which means, in effect, that uh, patients, for example, with a short cardiac arrest who are defibrillated early and get an early ROSC don't require a lot of airway management. They get basic airway management. Patients who have a prolonged cardiac arrest may get some advanced airway management, a supraglottic airway device or a tracheal tube. And therefore, if you observe the outcomes, what you see is that basic airway management appears to be very, very effective because patients who get just basic airway management survive and patients who, don't get, who get advanced airway management don't survive. So observational data, you can compensate for some of that, but in the end there's usually some residual confounding. And the history of observational studies is that they often give different results to subsequent randomised clinical trials. That's why randomised trials are the gold standard. That's why randomization is the key to success if you want to know an answer to a question. If you want to know about causation, what causes what, you need to do a randomised trial. So the basic, uh, basic airway is strongly favoured by all the observational data. Huge, huge data sets, particularly from the, from the Far East, uh, suggest that outcomes are much better with basic airway management, but we believe that that is confounded. And that confounding issue is going to come up in Airways 2 as well, and I'll explain. We, uh, we realised that was going to happen in Airways 2, and we have taken steps to address it, but it makes the interpretation of the results complex. And so... Until this year, there weren't any decent randomised trials. There was our feasibility study, um, Revive Airways, which showed that we could do this randomised trial because there was a lot of uncertainty as to whether it was even possible to randomise patients in cardiac arrest to different airway strategies. There are obvious ethical and logistical challenges involved. One of the most important things is that the research that we do uh, maintains a very high ethical standard and that patient safety is protected. In this instance, patients cannot... Uh, anticipate their cardiac arrest and neither can they consent to the research. And so it's really important uh, that we make sure that the study is done ethically uh, and that it's done in the right way. And that makes it very complex. Um, I'm pleased to see uh, Keith and Margaret here, who are two of our patient and public representatives, and they've been very instrumental in uh, supporting the study with colleagues from a larger group that's based in Bristol. Um, but ensuring that the patient's voice is heard is essential. So you know the deal. Uh, there's a tracheal tube and there's a supraglottic airway device. In this case, it's the eye gel. Um, well, I'll talk a bit later about whether different devices might have different uh, effects. Um, in the, throughout the entire presentation, I'm going to put the tracheal tube and all the data relating to the tracheal tube on the left, and I'm going to put the supraglottic airway device, the eye gel, on the right, and that's going to be everywhere. Uh, so that's, that'll help guide you through. I'm going to go into the data in some detail because to understand the study, you need to understand the data. And I'll also pause and just talk a little bit about research methodology and theory as well uh, to support that. So we set out to look for a difference between the two, uh, between the two uh, interventions, between tracheal intubation and the eye gel. And we postulated that the eye gel would give better results. I'm not going to go into detail why we thought the IGL would be better. There are some theoretical advantages of the IGL, principally its speed and ease of insertion, limited uh, interruptions in chest compressions. Um, and so we were looking for a 2% improvement in survival uh, to hospital discharge or to 30 days if the patient was still in hospital with a good functional status. And we chose the modified ranking scale, which is increasingly being used um, in cardiac arrest research. So you can start off by asking whether people are alive or dead, and that is helpful. Um, the advantage of, of alive or dead in research is that it's a very clear-cut outcome. It's hard to, um, hard to get, get that one confused, and it's hard to fake it. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, but when you, we speak to our patient and public group and others, they tell us that just being alive isn't really enough. So being alive in a persistent vegetative state is considered by some people to be worse than death. 
Um, and so in order to uh, make sure that our study does the right thing, we wanted to focus on the outcome that was relevant and important to patients. And that's not just surviving, but surviving in good shape. Surviving in a way that allows you to return to your former life, that allows you to return to your own home, that allows you to continue to appreciate the finer things in life. Uh, and so the modified ranking scale has the capacity to identify patients in various functional states. Naught to three, which I'll talk about in a minute, is the good, is the good end. Naught is completely as you were before. Um, and uh, one, two, and three have some degrees of impairment associated with them, uh, but generally people can live independently. Uh, four, five, and six are the worst end of things, and six is death, and obviously the majority of patients in Airways 2 had an outcome of six, um, and small numbers had outcomes of four and five, which are uh, severe uh, and profound disabilities. So that outcome has been selected specifically because it's the one that patients care about and it's the one we're looking for, not just survival, uh, but outcomes with good survival, good quality survival, if you like. Um, and uh, when you do a trial like this, you inevitably come up with a long number of secondary outcomes that are important too. So this is a multi-centre parallel group randomised controlled trial. Um, which means that we're conducting it in multiple ambulance services in England. There are two groups, and the patients are randomised between the two groups. The population that we randomised were adults over 18 in a non-traumatic cardiac arrest, and that means we also excluded patients with hanging and drowning, um, who were attended by a paramedic who had been randomised into the study, and that paramedic was the first or second to arrive on scene. And resuscitation was commenced or continued by ambulance staff or ambulance responders on the basis of established guidelines. And what that means is that, uh, in effect, we recruited a lot of patients into the study who had cardiac arrest but didn't get advanced airway management. I'm going to explain why we did that in a bit. The treatment on the left side, tracheal intubation, which is the comparison, it's the historical gold standard, if you like, of airway management uh, versus the new treatment, the IGEL. I've described the functional outcome we were looking for already. And we randomised paramedics one-to-one, -one, which means that the paramedics were, uh, e had an equal chance of going into either tracheal intubation uh, or, or the eye gel arm. Um, and we stratified the randomisation, which means that we specifically uh, uh, arranged the randomisation so that paramedic experience and a measure of their kind of urbanity versus rurality, I made those two words up, I think, but where they kind of lived in relation to cities and countries and so or where they worked in relation to cities and countries was equally distributed. Because clearly you could argue that uh, a more experienced paramedic might have better outcomes than a less experienced paramedic. And you might argue that uh, paramedics with, who got a long way to travel to get to a patient would have a, a, a trickier job because the patient would have been in cardiac arrest longer before they got there. So we wanted to make sure that the paramedics in the two groups had similar experience and that the arrival time, because it's such an important uh, factor in cardiac arrest, was going to be the same between the two groups. Um, and so we randomised 1,523 paramedics. And if you're one of those paramedics, thank you, um, because it's, we can't do the research unless you participate in the study. Um, and it's hard, it's, a, it's an extra bit of work. You've got to turn up for some training, you've got to submit some forms, you've got to be hassled by research paramedics mercilessly ringing you up, asking you why you haven't submitted a form. <laughs> Um, and so that's a tough, that's a tough thing to do. Um, and the reason you're doing it is because we want an answer to this question to help future patients. So thank you. Um, and those paramedics recruited 9,296 patients, which was a little bit more than our projected sample size of 9,070. And it's worth bearing in mind that trials of this nature do require very large numbers of patients. We're looking for small differences in survival. And so that's why they're so big, that's why they're so huge, that's why it's so difficult to do them. Um, now, blinding is a really important thing here. Now, because in an ideal world, what we would do is we would randomise the patients. So the patients would, at the point where the airway... So let's say the paramedic had attended the patient, they were about to undertake an advanced airway procedure, and then they would somehow identify how the, which arm the patient would be in. The ways you could do that would be opening an envelope, uh, getting onto your app, phoning up a telephone helpline, um, and so on and so forth. And as you can see, the problem with all of those kind of randomisation approaches is that uh, it would interfere with routine care. So you couldn't get to a job and go, right, uh, now I'm here, I must just open this envelope. Um, I think the relatives of the patient might look at you quite strangely if you tapped onto your app to see what the randomisation code was for that particular individual. And clearly it would get in the way of, uh, cardi of the cardiac arrest management. If it delayed cardiac arrest management, it would be unethical to randomise the patient. 
So we have to find a different way of, of randomising the patients. In the Paramedic 2 trial, which you'll hear about later, uh, because it's a drug trial and because it's comparing a drug versus a placebo, the paramedics simply opened the pack and got the adrenaline out or, or not uh, that they were going to give, and that allows the patients to be randomised individually. We didn't feel it was, it was possible to do that at scene, and indeed that would probably lead to a lot of problems because in reality paramedics just wouldn't have time, the patients wouldn't get randomised and they wouldn't get into our study. So we randomised the paramedics instead. And that's called cluster randomization, and it's called cluster randomization because there are a cluster of patients recruited by each paramedic, and all those patients, of course, get the same treatment, whatever it is that, that paramedic's been randomized to. Cluster randomization has a whole set of complex problems associated with it. Um, the main problem with cluster randomization is that uh, the cluster gets all the same, the same thing. So if you've got large clusters, um, then there's a risk of uh, bias creeping in because, for example, if you had a small number, of, say they had 10 paramedics only in a study and five of them were very, very good at what they did and got randomised one way and five got randomised the other way, then it would be the paramedics that you'd be testing, not the intervention. Fortunately, with 1,523 clusters, we're in good, we're in good shape because we've got loads of clusters and also the number of patients per paramedic is relatively small in most cases, as you'll see. So that does help us a lot uh, with the randomization process. But it also means that the paramedics knew what they'd been randomized to. They knew what the patient was going to get. And that is a problem. Um, and the main reason that's a problem in research in general is that if you can predict uh, whether a patient, what a patient's going to get in a research trial, then the ability to predict may alter your decision to enroll the patient or not. So, you may, for example, think this patient would really benefit from the, a treatment. I, don't, I know that they're not going to get that treatment, therefore I won't put them in this trial. And that introduces systematic bias into a study, and that systematic bias undermines the quality of the results. So the big risk of cluster randomization in this case was that the paramedics involved in the study, uh, if they uh, could opt to enrol or not enrol a patient, uh, might preferentially enrol patients in a way that would undermine the study results. And so to prevent that from happening, we decided the only, only reasonable approach was to enrol every single patient that the paramedics attended, every single one. Uh, and that meant that there was no decision about whether the patients were in. They were automatically enrolled if they met the inclusion criteria. So that gives us a very, very reliable result because the patients are in regardless of what the paramedic actually does, in fact. So the paramedic may not follow the algorithm that they've been assigned to. They may choose to do something different. And indeed, we specifically allowed paramedics to do that in order to maintain patient safety. It was clear that it would not be uh, feasible for us to say to paramedics, you, we have allocated you to for example, tracheal intubation, you must attempt to intubate the patient even if you think there's no chance of success and it's not in the patient's best interest. That would not be helpful. People would not sign up to our study if they thought that there was a risk that they would be required to do something that was not in the patient's best interest. And clearly an ethics committee would not support that, neither would our patient and public group. So paramedics must retain the freedom to do what they think is right for the patient in the situations in which they find themselves. You all know from practical experience, for example, that some patients are just not in a good position for tracheal, tracheal intubation. Uh, and therefore, tracheal intubation cannot be attempted, uh, particularly early on in a cardiac arrest, particularly if a patient's access is difficult, for example. So, what that means is that we have a very pragmatic study. We have a study that, in effect, says in a real-world environment, if your strategy is that paramedics will, in general, intubate first, what happens? Or, if in general the strategy is to place an eye gel first, what happens? And the only way of answering that question in this context with a very high degree of reliability is to get every single patient. And that means that many of those patients won't receive the intervention of interest. They may just receive basic airway management. They get, they get better quickly. Uh, and so that's a very, com for a very complicated analysis. It makes the, the study very good but it makes the analysis very complicated. And we realised at the outset that a significant number of patients were not going to get either intervention. And we had to think about how we were going to manage that. And you can see the effect of that in this study. Also, 
finding every single cardiac arrest that a paramedic attends in an ambulance service is not very easy. Um, and so we had a triple approach, which was asked, we asked paramedics to report par cardiac arrests. We also trawled the CAD on a daily basis, or near daily ba basis, to find cardiac arrests. And we also used routine procedures that all ambulance services use to identify and audit their cardiac arrests in order to try and find every single one. And our four research paramedics in the four ambulance regions did some truly heroic work, um, supported by others, in order to get those cardiac arrests. But they were absolutely critical, um, absolutely critical to the success of the study. So thank you to them and, and everybody who's, who's involved in that heroic task. Um, that's a good time to mention those, those individuals and the ambulance regions that we... Uh, that we worked with, 21 million people covered by these four ambulance services. Uh, it's a huge, huge undertaking, and the work that everybody did it was phenomenal. Um, this graph shows you our predicted recruitment and our actual recruitment. Uh, I like to show this graph slightly tongue-in-cheek, because this makes it look like it went swimmingly well from start to finish and everything was fine. <laughs> Um, it wasn't actually quite as easy as the graph suggests, uh, and we had some interesting trials and tribulations along the way. Um, we discovered that there is a seasonal variability in uh, cardiac arrest, which uh, I said there wasn't, but Richard said there was, and Richard was right and I was wrong. Uh, we discovered that, uh, that uh, recruiting patients is difficult and challenging, and keeping the numbers up was hard, but on the other hand... Um, we were reassured that we really were getting all the cardiac arrests because our numbers were constant, our staff were doing the job, um, and we were picking up every single patient. So let me show you some of the results, um, and I'll take you through these graphs and we can just kind of look at them in a bit more detail. The, it, it's, um, these are quite technical stuff in places, but in order to really understand what's really going on, you need to dig around in the data. It's not, the outcomes are not as straightforward as they look. So just to look at the paramedics, there are 2,041 paramedics that expressed an initial interest when we uh, put out our kind of invitation to participate. And it's worth bearing in mind, just from a general perspective, that the uh, paramedics that took part in our study were volunteers. That was the right thing to do. We know that compelling people to do research is generally not a good idea, particularly not in the UK. And we therefore um, sought volunteers. The volunteers who came forward are likely more enthusiastic about cardiac arrest, more enthusiastic about airway management, more enthusiastic about research. Whether they represent exactly the entire paramedic population of the UK is up for you to, you to decide. Um, but one could argue that one of the challenges of this study is that the paramedics in the study are not necessarily typical of every single paramedic in England or indeed in the, in the wider kind of global paramedic picture. Um, of those... Some didn't make it to training. Um, some uh, booked on training but didn't, didn't attend. A very small number of patients went to the training but then decided not to participate, and that's important. We wanted paramedics who were pretty much in equipoise as to whether uh, tracheal intubation or IGL was a good idea, much as I am, or was and still am, really, in some respect. Um, the, it's, we don't want people with very strong views because strong-viewed people working in trials can sometimes drag the results around a bit. So we wanted people who were willing to be randomised to either treatment option. Um, and the vast majority of paramedics did, did go with that, but some chose not to be randomised, and I respect that decision. It's better not to participate if you've got very strong views. Um, and so that meant uh, that uh, overall we randomised 1,523 paramedics. Um, and as you can see, they attended 12,700 um, patients in the intubation group and 13,500 in the SJ group. Now, immediately, uh, although our paramedic numbers were pretty balanced across the two arms, our patient numbers are not balanced. So we've got more patients in the SGA group than in the tracheal intubation group. And that was a bit of a worry because it suggested the possibility that we'd missed some patients that should be in the tracheal intubation arm but weren't in our study. And so we spent quite a lot of time looking at this. Um, and it turns out that, in fact, there are a relatively small number of very high recruiting paramedics who kind of recruited between 40 and 50 patients each. And because they're a small number, uh, they're not randomised equally. When you randomise small numbers of patients, you can get quite a lot of that imbalance. And so a, there was a tendency, uh, by chance, for higher recruiting paramedics to be in the SGA arm. Um, and that's, that's caused that imbalance. That means that there isn't any bias per se, but it means that our, our arms for patients aren't strictly, aren't strictly balanced. We couldn't have 
stratified for that. We couldn't have allowed for that because we couldn't predict in advance which paramedics would be the highest recruiting paramedics. But the highest recruiting paramedics weren't uh, evenly distributed between tracheal intubation and uh, the eye gel. So of those numbers at the top, sort of 12 and a half and 13 and a half thousand, um, there were a chunk of patients where resuscitation was not attempted. So the paramedic attended the cardiac arrest, but no resuscitation attempt was made. And there's about 6,300 in the tracheal intubation arm and 6,580 in the SGA arm. And the reasons are listed there. Again, some really, truly heroic. There's a, there's down the bottom right-hand corner, it says reason unknown at one. That's pretty good going, isn't it, from terms of data collection? And if you compare those two sides, uh, they're very similar, suggesting that the patient's, uh, the, the actual attempt to resuscitation was very similar between the two groups. Um, and left us 6,500 in the tracheal intubation group and 7,000 in the eye gel group. We then excluded patients who met our exclusion criteria, um, and of which the com by far the commonest was that the paramedic who was randomised attended, but attended later than the second paramedic. And we didn't want those patients because we thought it was very likely that airway management would be established. Um, and we didn't, what we didn't want to do was remove functioning airway devices or anything like that that might, be in, to, might disadvantage the patient. Uh, we removed some children, some traumatic cardiac arrests, um, and some other, as you can see in that long list of exclusion criteria. And that left us with 4,410 patients randomised to tracheal intubation and 4,886 patients randomised to the eye gel. And again, a little bit of imbalance because of those high recruiting paramedics. Uh, not being evenly allocated across the two arms. Um, and about, so about a 400 patient difference in the two groups. Um, large numbers, as you can see. And those patients were the ones that were allocated. So they should have received tracheal intubation on the left and SJ on the right. They didn't all receive that, of course. Um, but those are the key uh, analysis groups that we looked at. Those are the patients of interest. And in those two groups, as I say, we had a e pretty even spread of paramedics. So 696 paramedics in one, 686 in the other. Um, on, in general, uh, paramedics doing our two-year trial saw a median of five cardiac arrests. So not very many, two, two or three a year. Um, that's an important observation in itself, of course, uh, because low volumes of um, cardiac arrests means that it's hard to keep the skills up, particularly airway skills. Uh, but ranging from, uh, impressively ranging from 1 to 48 and 1 to 56. So some very busy paramedics as well. Um, and in some services, uh, small senior paramedics are targeted to particular patients. Um, that's fine. Now, very importantly, if you look below that, um, of the 4,410 patients here, only 3,400 actually received uh, some kind of attempt to place an advanced airway, either a tracheal tube or an SGA. 985 patients did not receive advanced airway management. On the other side, 4,886, 4, 4,000 patients received at least one attempt and 722 received no advanced airway management. So already something interesting is happening here because in fact the proportion, I'll show you in more detail later, the proportion of patients in this group who receive no advanced airway management is significantly higher than the proportion in this group that received no advanced airway management. So in other words, if you were randomised to tracheal intubation, you were less likely to receive any form of advanced airway management than if you were randomised to the eye gel. And we'll talk a bit more about that, why that might be. When you do a randomised trial like this, it's very important to ensure that the two groups that you're looking at are well balanced. In studies of this size, with 4,000 patients in a group, you'd expect the basic characteristics of the patients to be pretty much the same in the two arms. If they're not the same in the two arms, you've got a major problem. Your trial has failed and some form of bias has got into the study. So looking at these kind of characteristics, it's important to reassure us that in effect the patients were the same in the two arms. The only difference was the allocated airway management strategy. And so you can see that their proportion of, uh, of male versus female and their uh, ages were very similar. And if you look at the types of cardiac arrest and the other response char characteristics, again, they're very similar. So the time from the 999 call to arrival um, was very similar with, a, with an interquartile range between 5 and 11 in both cases. That takes 50% of the population. In effect, the paramedic arrived between 5 and 11 minutes. 
Um, and then, interestingly, the, the time from the first paramedic arrival to the arrival of our trial paramedic was, very, was pretty much zero, because in most cases, our, or many cases, the Airways 2 paramedic was the first to arrive. So, uh, very similar across those two groups. And if you look at the rhythms, obviously very important, because rhythm very much determines outcome in cardiac arrest. Very similar rates of asystole, ventricular fibrillation, uh, PEA, and uh, and even pulsus ventricular tachycardia. So these are very, very similar patients with a similar ambulance response and similar presenting rhythms. And also very similar rates of witness cardiac arrest, uh, very, very similar rates of bystander uh, CPR and defibrillation, um, and a few patients who got a return of spontaneous circulation before the, the ambulance service arrived due to the use of um, AEDs. So this is reassuring. It tells us that we are comparing two similar groups. It helps to uh, reassure us that the trial has worked and that any differences between the two arms are due to the intervention and not due to other factors. This is the primary outcome. So this is the outcome of the study. This is the result. Um, and the result is that the percentage of people achieving a good outcome, MRS 0 to 3, intracranial intubation was 6.8% and 6.4% in the SGA group, in the IGEL group. And although there is a 0.4% difference in those two numbers, we were looking for a 2% difference. Uh, the statistical significance of that is none. These are, to all intents and purposes, the same result. Uh, what it means, in effect, is if you did the trial again, uh, you'd probably get a very similar answer. Uh, you might get it the other way around next time. So it might be 6.4 and 6.8 the other way around. But as far as uh, the analysis is concerned, uh, this is a null result. It tells us that the eye gel is not better uh, than tracheal intubation in terms of achieving an outcome. And if you look down the categories of outcome, as I mentioned earlier, uh, unfortunately, regressively, an MRS of six is by far the most common outcome. But in fact, the spread of outcomes across the two groups is very similar. So, uh, in effect, there is good evidence here that in an all-comers population, a strategy of a tracheal intubation has the same outcome as a strategy of IGEL. And there is no difference between the two groups. And that's the headline result. And I'm going to say some other stuff now, and I'm going to mention this again because it's important not to lose sight of this because this is the result. But this result includes all of the patients. And as I mentioned earlier, many of the patients did not receive any intervention. Some of the patients received the opposite intervention. So some patients who were allocated to receive tracheal intubation received an IGEL and vice versa. And so we need to look at that in a bit more detail because we had anticipated that would happen. That kind of crossover effect where patients got the opposite treatment was inevitable um, but important to consider. This, by the way, is a graph that shows the same thing. Uh, sometimes called a forest plot. Though we've got one forest on it. just one, one line. Um, and the... The null result is here, and the point estimate is here, and the 95% confidence intervals, which is the bars, across the one line, which means no difference. I'll show you a few more of those in a bit, but the key thing is, because the bars of 95% confidence go across the one line, there is no difference between the two treatments. In terms of secondary outcomes, we looked at quite a lot of stuff. I'm going to show you some of the most important ones. The first thing to say is that it was it was a very clear statistical uh, advantage in terms of the actual ventilation success. So we gem we, the protocol specified two attempts at the allocated device, so two attempts at tracheal intubation or two attempts at the, S at the SGA, the IGL. Um, if, that was, if they were unsuccessful, then we advise usually switching to the opposite device uh, or whatever the local ambulance service recommended through its airway algorithms. And what you can see here is that the chances of you achieving a successful airway um, are significantly, and the p-value for those who like p-values is very low here, 95% uh, um, confidence was around a point estimate of the odds ratios. There's no doubt that if, you, uh, if, you, if your strategy is SGA first, then more patients will get ventilation success. That's the chest going up and down if you try the IGL first. Um, and that's, that won't come as any surprise to anybody, I'm sure. Uh, tracheal intubation success, as you can see, is 79% after two attempts. Um, and that set, sat behind there is, an, is a tracheal intubation success, because that 79 includes some patients who actually received an IGL. It's the whole group. It's, the actual tracheal intubation success is about 72 73%. 
And that was a finding that is at odds to some extent with reported literature, which tends to report quite high success rates for intubation. The reality is, is that uh, those reported success rates are quite selective and selected. Um, people don't rush to report um, success rates that are a bit lower. Um, they tend to only report success rates that are good. And so uh, we weren't at all surprised that the success rate was in the 70s for tracheal intubation. That was kind of what we'd expected. Um, and in a minute, when we talk a bit about the PART trial in the United States, they had an even lower tracheal intubation success rate, which, again, they had also expected. The other thing that was clearly different was the chance of losing an airway once you'd got it in. Again, this won't surprise you. So uh, tracheal tubes, in effect, what, we lost about 5% of those once they'd been placed. Uh, on the op opposite arm, about 10% in the SGA arm. So you're more, sitting more likely to lose your airway uh, once it's been secured if you place a, if you're allocated to an eye gel. Not surprising. Um, the other outcome that was surprising, I think, for, to many people was that we looked specifically at regurgitation and aspiration. Um, we did that because there's often concerns with a supraglottic airway device. They don't protect the airway as well as tracheal intubation does. And there's a risk of uh, vomiting, uh, regurgitation and aspiration, which, as you know, are, are common uh, during cardiac arrest. Um, and so what, was, what surprised us overall was that the actual uh, risks of regurgitation and aspiration were the same. So there's no significant difference uh, between the two groups in terms of the risk of the patient regurgitating or aspirating at any time during the cardiac arrest. Now, that actually masks something a bit more complicated that sat underneath that, and that's in the four, in the four uh, rows below. So in, before any kind of advanced airway management was attempted, there was a higher rate of uh, regurgitation and, indeed, aspiration um, in the... Uh, so when we're here, so regurgitation and aspiration before in the tracheal intubation group. And that may come as a bit of a surprise, but in fact, uh, one of the things that I've already alluded to is that patients allocated to tracheal intubation were less likely to get tracheal intubation. Also, there's good evidence that tracheal intubation will occur later in a cardiac arrest than the placement of an SGA. So an SGA is quick and easy to put in generally, and so it will maybe put in earlier. In Henry Wang's study, in a um, uh, part trial, he specifically measured that and showed that tracheal intubation occurred a couple of minutes later in cardiac arrest um, than placement of a supraglottic airway device. So clearly, that what's happening in those extra couple of minutes is the patient has an opportunity to uh, regurgitate and aspirate, uh, and that's why there is a higher regurgitation and aspiration rate before placement of the airway device in patients allocated to tracheal intubation. Conversely, after the airway has been placed, or during or after the airway attempt, you see a slightly higher rate of regurgitation and aspiration actually during the attempt or after the attempt in the SGA group, uh, which, again, is probably what you'd expect. Um, but, the, but the numbers here are actually very close, uh, and in many respects, the, the, over, say the overall headline is that if you, uh, if you compare a strategy of tracheal tube first, first versus uh, an eye gel first, the patient's ra overall rate of regurgitation and aspiration are very similar. Mainly because, although there's a bit more regurgitation and aspiration with an SGA, the, uh, the is placed sooner, whereas tracheal intubation may be placed later. And so that's why that works that way. But actually, the numbers are very similar. And a lot of the concerns about SGAs, I mean, the eye gel has no inflatable cuff, uh, there's, there's really lim very little evidence here that there's any significant major differences in that particular factor. And so in some respects, we can put that one to bed. The other thing we did in a very small number of patients was look at chest compression fraction. Um, and I just mentioned this. It's a very small sample, but some, there's been some concern that intubation is associated with pauses in chest compression. And in two of our ambulance trusts, we got, gave some people some CPR cards, um, which allowed us to measure the compression fraction. Here are the results. The answer is there's no, we, didn't, we didn't notice a difference in compression fraction of significance. It is a bit lower in the tracheal intubation group, but this small sample is small, doesn't really tell us very much. Uh, but we didn't find any evidence from this small sample that um, tracheal intubation was associated with pauses in chest compression. <coughs> now, I've said already that we noticed that um, 
a lot of the patients in the trial weren't going to get advanced airway management. And so we therefore pre-specified an analysis where we only looked at patients who received some form of advanced airway management. So an attempt was made to manage their airway with either a supraglottic airway device or a tracheal tube. And in those patients, just those patients who actually received some form of advanced airway management, we saw a significant difference in outcome. So our primary outcome measure of a good functional outcome uh, was significantly different. So 2.6% uh, in tracheal intubation arm compared to 3.9% uh, in the eye gel arm. And this achieves a high degree of statistical significance. And when we look at the corresponding forest plot, the bar is well over the line. So this analysis suggests that patients do better with a supraglottic airway device than with a tracheal tube. But we need to be very, very careful about this because this is not the whole population. The first thing that, you, that we, the astute of you will have noticed is that the survival here, remember the survival in the, in the main analysis was 6.4 versus 6.8%. The survival here, or not survival, the good outcome rate is gone down to 2.6 versus 3.9%. And the reason for that is that we've taken out a lot of the good, the good fast survivors, the guys who don't get advanced airway management and who get an early return of spontaneous circulation and who do very well. And so this is a selected population. <laughs> It's not all comers, um, and that selection has the potential to introduce bias into the overall study. And that bias is important. I'm going to talk a bit more about that because the interpretation of Airways 2 hinges on understanding the risk for bias in these, in these figures. So when you just look at the patients who got some form of advanced airway management, there is definitely an advantage to the supraglottic airway device. We did some subgroup analyses, which means that we looked at specific populations within the whole patient cohort. We compared those in the Utstein comparator group, which is those with a witnessed VF cardiac arrest, um, with bystander CPR, compared to those who didn't have it, and we didn't find any differences. So here, again, it crosses the one line and it crosses the one line, so uh, we can't, there's no obvious difference uh, between those two groups. Similarly, we looked at... Um, so group analyses for ventilation success. Now, interestingly, uh, what you see here is that if there was, if, in, if those, those two attempts at ventilation uh, were successful, those two attempts to start with were successful, then the eye gel had much better outcomes. Um, whereas if there was no ventilation success with the first two attempts, then we can't say anything about that, about the two groups. So where ventilation was successful in those first two attempts, then the eye gel appeared to be beneficial. But again, this is a selective population because it, it excludes those patients that didn't, that didn't receive any form of advanced airway management. And the last subgroup analysis was those witnessed uh, by uh, emergency medical services, by ambulance services, and not witnessed. And again, there's no evidence that there's a difference between those, between those patients either. So... Um, I've heard this trial uh, dis described as a Rorschach plot, ink plot uh, test for paramedics. Uh, you may be familiar with the ink blot testing technique that was a, a psychological and psychoanalysis technique that was used in the 30s where uh, patients were shown ink blots and asked to say what they thought it looked like. Um, and then decisions were made about their suitability for various things on the basis of how they interpreted it. What's this, by the way? You're all too nervous to say, aren't you? Because each, each, each ink blot has got things you're supposed to say and things you're not supposed to say. Uh, if you're saying kind of seeing, seeing evil demons, that's probably a bad sign. Uh, the, um, so the, uh, in some respects, when you look at an ink blot test, you bring to it what, uh, what you believe beforehand. And so this particular test has runs, this particular trial can be interpreted in, in various ways depending on what your preference is. And I'll talk a bit more about, about, about what that means. But to really get to grips with that... Uh, let's just look at the, the results in a bit more detail. Remember, I've already said, I'm going to I'd say it again, that overall, the most reliable result from this study is that there's no difference between the two treatments. However, there's a, there's a flow diagram that shows in a bit more detail what's really going on. And this flow diagram uh, is adapted from that that's post published in the paper that you've got today. Um, I'm going to take it in two parts. So I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to look at the top part, which looks at those patients that did not receive any form of advanced airway management. And I'm going to look at the bottom part, which looks at the patients that did receive advanced airway management. So here's the top part of the graph. And so the first thing to say, remember that we had 9,296 patients, randomised 
to these, into these two groups. Okay, and these are all cardiac arrests. Now, of the 4,400 over here, 22.4% got no advanced airway management. So if they're randomized to kill intubation, 20, almost 25% of the group got no advanced airway management. Over here, that figure is 15%. So what's happening here is that there's an element of, I suspect, what's going on. You'll, you'll know better than I. You, you, you go to cardiac arrests. So the question is, why is it that patients who have been allocated to intubation are less likely to get advanced airway management? Because we know they're the same patients, because we've got our baseline characteristics are the same. And I think the answer to that is fairly, is fairly likely to be that uh, tracheal intubation is harder. It takes two paramedics to the bougie. It's got a lot of things going on. The patient needs to be in the right position. You need to be in the right position. It's a bit of a big deal. Um, and so it takes longer. There's a bit more trepidation, a bit more uncertainty about the technique. Uh, and so therefore, there's, there's delay, as I've uh, alluded to, in getting round to intubation. And in that time, potentially, one of two things may happen. One is that the patient may get better. They may achieve a ROSC uh, while uh, you're not, admi not administering tracheal intubation. Or uh, the decision may be made to, to terminate the resuscitation attempt. So, for example, uh, the resuscitation attempt may be in progress and then a DNAR may come to light or the patient's wishes may be discovered. Uh, our family member may indicate uh, that the patient has a DNAR and you may decide that it's time to stop the resuscitation on the basis of the patient's known, known wishes. So potentially, uh, because of the delay in intubation, there's a larger group of patients that don't get advanced airway management. The IGL is easier to put in, it gets put in sooner and quicker, and so the proportion of patients is smaller. Now, interestingly, this group is the, is the group, as I've alluded to, that gets better quickly short cardiac arrests, early defibrillation, early return to spontaneous circulation. The outcome here is great. Okay, compared to the total population, the outcome here is a good outcome of 21.6% and 20.5%. And you'll notice that those are not the same. They may seem quite similar numbers, but actually there's about 70, patients, 70 good survivors difference in that. So there are about 70 good survivors lurking up here. They never get down into this bit down here. And so... Actually, most of, the, most of the survivors in the tracheal intubation arm didn't get the tracheal intubation at all. So this is a really important observation. And in fact, it, the, you could argue that, in fact, the outcome is better up here for tracheal intubation, bearing in mind that the patient, none of these patients actually got tracheal intubation or an SGA. Uh, and if you argue that, you're actually arguing that not doing anything is better. So basic airway management and not proceeding to an advanced airway management has not harmed these patients. In fact, you could argue that not proceeding to advanced airway management has led to better outcomes in these patients. If you look at detail of what these patients are like, because one of the questions is how similar are these two groups? So these are the two groups of patients that did not receive advanced airway management. So when you look at these patients, actually, the randomised tracheal intubation, I mean, they're very similar. But if you wanted to call which group you would expect to do better, the tracheal intubation group has got a, they're a little bit older, they've got a little bit of a longer response time, they've got a little bit of a higher rate of, uh, of um, sorry, a little, bit of, a little bit of a lower rate of VF, um, and a little bit of a lower rate of witnessed cardiac arrest. So they're very similar. But if you wanted to call these two arms one way or the other, I'd call the tracheal intubation on the baseline characteristics less likely to survive. But oddly, they're not. They're more likely to survive. And so it's a very interesting observation that this is where a lot of the trial's main results is, are influenced by. So the main results of the trial, the headline results of no difference, is actually strongly influenced by what's going on up here because a lot of the good quality outcomes are sat in the patients that had no advanced airway management. If we move on to the bottom half of the graph... Oh, if we move on to the bottom half of the graph... So these, remember, on the left is tracheal intubation and on the right is the eye gel. And this, the crossover effect is quite differential. So if you look at the, those who are allocated tracheal intubation, in fact, in 18% of the time, they actually got an eye gel first. Presumably because tracheal intubation was felt to be unlikely to be successful, access was difficult, and for whatever reason, 18% actually got an SGA first. In the eye gel arm only 2.8% of patients got a tracheal tube first. So the crossover that has occurred between the two groups, but it's also a differential crossover. So there's more crossover 
to, to the eye gel in the tracheal intubation arm than there is the other opposite way around. And then when you look at the outcomes, what you see broadly is that if you get the SGA first, you do a lot better. So the secondary sensitive analysis I showed you that, that in effect showed that the eye gel was better compared this whole group with this whole group. If you just compare those who got the eye gel with those who got the tube, you get a very, very clear advantage for the eye gel. But the reality is, is that there's an element of selection going on here. So paramedics, remember, could choose whether to pro provide advanced airway management and also which advanced airway management to provide. And it may be uh, that, uh, in effect, the, the patients with the better chance of survival were getting an SGA and the patients with the worst chance of survival we're getting tracheal intubation. And if you bring those 72 patients from the top back down into this side, they stay even out, which is why the overall <coughs> result is null, no difference. That's very complicated, isn't it? So, where does that leave us? Oh, by the way, the two groups, having said that, the two groups that were randomised to tracheal intubation and the SGA uh, were very similar, were very, very similar. So they look like the same patients, but their outcome is different. Uh, so these are the patients that received advanced air management. So, these, so they, this, is the, this, this group of patients down here, this is what they look like, and they look very similar. So what does it all mean? So when you uh, compare a strategy of tracheal intubation first versus superglottic airway first, you get the same outcomes. Uh, the SGA ventilates the patient more, more reliably and successfully, and there's no real difference in aspiration and regurgitation. We can be pretty confident about that from airways too. If the patient actually received advanced airway management in our trial, then those patients that received the eye gel did better, significantly better, than those that received tracheal intubation. So you could argue that if you're managing a patient in cardiac arrest and you've you decided it's time for an, to give place an advanced airway, that they, it would be sensible to place an eye gel. But you could also argue that because of the selection of, of patients who received the advanced airway management and because of crossover, there is an element of bias in this. I also have explained that the evidence in the upper part of the flow ch chart doesn't suggest that actually moving to advanced area management improves outcomes for patients. And that is itself an interesting observation. The uh, Jabra trial done in France and Belgium earlier this year, or reported earlier this year, compared basic area management, bag valve, valve mask ventilation with tracheal intubation, and in effect found no difference between the two in terms of outcomes from cardiac arrest suggesting that tracheal intubation does not improve outcomes when compared to basic airway management. We still have no evidence that advanced airway management improves outcomes in cardiac arrest. So there are a few possible conclusions you can draw from this. You could conclude that intubation is better. Actually, there isn't really any evidence that intubation is better. You could conclude that it's the same, um, but you can't really get anything out of this data that tells you that intubation is going to give you better outcomes. You could conclude that SGAs are better. So you could say, yeah, but when it actually comes down to it, if you're going to put an advanced airway management in, uh, parts and airways too would suggest that you get better outcomes if you use an SGA first. You could say that. You could also say that the there are differences between part and uh, airways too, and that some of it might be due to the SGA. So are all superglottic airway devices the same? Do they have the same characteristics? Do they perform in the same way in cardiac arrest? We don't know. You could say that actually advanced airway management doesn't really have any benefits in cardiac arrest. And actually what we're really doing is just testing two things that have equal um, uh, ineffectiveness. So it doesn't really matter what you do, because in fact, the choice of airway management is less important uh, than that airway management not getting in the way of the things that really work. You could argue that the real, the real trick to cardiac arrest is to manage the airway by all means, but do so in a way that doesn't harm the patient, that doesn't get in the way of those chest compressions and defibrillation. And then, in fact, 
uh, actually, airway, the choice of airway strategy is probably not that influential in patient outcomes. And you should certainly always argue that paramedics are amazing. You could argue that what the paramedics actually did in Airways 2 is they identified the patients who would benefit from the best airway strategy and gave it to them. And the reason that the two groups are the same overall is because the paramedics always match the right airway technique to the right patient. That's possible. So, what I think this means is that patients during a cardiac arrest do need some oxygen. Uh, I think clearance of carbon dioxide is less of an issue. It's more about making sure that there's some oxygen in their lungs. They probably don't need oxygen delivery very early on in a cardiac arrest, where the priority is, is chest compressions and defibrillation. But as a cardiac arrest progresses, we should manage their airway. I think what's really important is that whatever we do, we're good at it, that it's effective, and that it doesn't get in the way. We don't. What, in some respects, we should choose the airway strategy that's least harmful. And the least harmful is the one that is, is the most effective for the least intervention. Because the more you mess about with the airway, the less you're concentrating on good quality CPR, uh, on early defibrillation, and any other specific therapies that might be beneficial in specific circumstances. And that means that all paramedics need to continue to have very good airway skills. Whether that means that all paramedics need to be able to intubate or not is still a question for further discussion. I've alluded to the fact that the frequency of cardiac arrest exposure and the frequency of intubation uh, is low in, in the paramedic population. And certainly in the time that I've been working on this in the last eight years, because I'm a clinician too and I go to a lot of cardiac arrests uh, with, with South Western Ambulance Service, that there's been a sea change in the management of airway from tracheal intubation towards supraglottic airway devices. The, it is quite reasonable to conclude that intubation it does not, no, no longer needs to sit in the, in the standard skill set of paramedics. However, paramedics will need to continue to perform laryngoscopy, for example, to remove foreign bodies from the upper airway. And we also have to decide what is the right strategy for a patient in whom a supraglottic airway is ineffective and how to manage that patient's airway. And so these are difficult decisions for the paramedic community and for ambulance services to decide how best to respond to these results. In the vast majority of patients, supraglottic airway device works well and is associated with good outcomes from cardiac arrest. That means that exposure to intubation will go down further. And there are many, many paramedics now that I meet on the road who have done very limited, if any, real intubations in real people. And so that does call into question whether we can really seriously maintain those skills in a way that can be assured and governed uh, for the overall paramedic population. I'd like to finish by inviting a couple of my colleagues from the trial to come and join me on the stage, and we'll just take some questions from the audience. Um, Jerry, would you mind joining us? Um, Kim, where are you? You're hidden at the back. Come on. Well, I think we should give him a round of applause while people are moving. <laughs> who, else is hiding, who else is hiding in the room? So, lots of food for thought uh, from this very high quality trial uh, with, as you'll see, a mind-bogglingly complex. <laughs> who here, we should have had a, um, a vote at the beginning, shouldn't we, about um, who thinks uh, uh, intubation should continue or which is the best or what do you think the results of the trial were and then have another vote at the end, but oh, I forgot to do that. <laughs> um, so who's got questions? There must be lots and lots of questions here, don't be afraid because actually the meaning of this trial for you who are going to be out there doing things with these patients is really, really important. OK, so uh, thank you, someone there. Tell us who you are. I know who you are, but tell everybody <laughs> else who you are. Hi, I'm, I'm Richard Pilbury, um, Research Paramedic from Yorkshire Ambulance Service. This is not necessarily just specific about Airways 2, but probably all pre-hospital uh, cardiac arrest trials, but why do we not make adjustments for the receiving hospital that these patients get taken to? So that's one for Jerry, I think, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very good question and actually it could be a criticism, well it probably has been a criticism of, of our study and others. The, the studies carried out in the United States generally are better at getting that, that data. I think the bottom line is it's very difficult to get all that in-hospital data as well as doing all the pre-hospital stuff. Um, the other thing is, to, and I'm sure Jonathan was perhaps going to remark on this as well, is when you've got so many 
patients enrolled in the trial, one would expect that with the randomization process that probably all of those patients are receiving equivalent treatments. Of course, we haven't, we haven't proven that, and you're right to ask the question, but it, it's likely on balance that they, like both groups or both arms of the trial, receive similar post-resuscitation care processes in hospital. Unfortunately, we can't prove it. We can't prove it. It's, I think there's huge numbers of patients. It's very unlikely that the post-resuscitation care was influenced by the pre-hospital airway management. Um, you know, the reality is, is that the intensive care units that generally manage these patients wouldn't know what the paramedic's initial airway management had been. Um, and it's hard to imagine they think, well, this patient was given an eye gel pre-hospital, so we must therefore call them, uh, you know, or whatever. I, I, I think that they are treated as a homogenous group. Um, and so I think it's unlikely that the, the, the hospital factors have influenced the outcome of this study, because we assume through randomization that the, that the patients are equally distributed across hospitals that have uh, special facilities and, other, and others. I mean, I can perhaps add a personal comment to that, as, as a, you know, because I work in, in a critical care unit and was obviously potentially receiving these patients. I was certainly aware of patients who either had tubes or eye gels as they came in, but you know, I had no idea whether they'd been randomised, whether they were even in the trial, whether they perhaps randomised to the trachea intubation or but ended up with an eye gel. I, I really, really, I'm certain, at least in our hospital, that did not influence treatment one way or the other. Cool, thank you. Okay, question here. Tell us who you are, please. Hi, I'm Jonathan Green from SWAST. Um, I um, listened to your podcast, and if I understood what you were saying correctly, Jonathan, um, you were saying that although um, this trial looked at a very broad spectrum of clinicians, um, the results should be just as relevant to any subset of clinicians, including, for instance, um, paramedics who um, get a lot more exposure to intubation, such as critical care paramedics, for instance. Could you expand on that a little bit, please? Yeah, very happy to. I think the one of the one of the challenges that this trial and indeed the part study have come in for is kind of an attitude of, well, I'm a better intubator, so it's all fine. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of very good intubators uh, out there in the audience, but it, I don't think it's intubation per se that's the issue here. So being brilliant at putting a plastic tube between the patient's cord is nice. Um, but there are lots of other factors that kind of go with that. So one of our co-investigators, Steve Brett, rather helpfully described this as the opera of intubation. So the thing is, is that you might be a very good intubator, but you've still got to get the patient in the right position, you've still got to get your kit out, you've still got to get somebody to help you, you've still got to go through the intubation process. And it's often quite, excuse me, quite a focal point in the cardiac arrest management. Um, and, uh, and then there are other theoretical concerns about tequila tubes that, that, that also follow. So uh, these are all completely theoretical, really. Uh, Jerry may, have, may know a bit more about the evidence here, but there is, you know, there's a theoretical risk that, I mean, hyper, hyperventilation is quite common with, through tequila tubes, um, and so the rate of ventilation can get quite high, in my experience, at cardiac arrests. So a tequila tube is placed, it's correctly placed, and the bag is given to somebody to squeeze, and they squeeze it quite quickly. Um, and then that can increase the intrathoracic pressure, which reduces venous return, which reduces coronary blood flow, which reduces the risk of ROSC. And so I, in other fora, I've, I've commented that sometimes the rather um, unpleasant noise that you get around an, a superglottic airway device during chest compressions, which some people say, I don't like that noise, it sounds sound like, sound like a, the farty noise, you know, it's kind of, when I push on the chest, the, it's a kind of funny noise, I like a nice quiet, nice quiet cardiac arrest with a nice tube. Uh, but actually, that, that noise might be quite protective, because it might be venting excess pressure out of the thorax, which actually might be quite helpful in, in, in return spontaneous circulation. So the, what that means is that it, just being a brilliant intubator isn't what we've tested here. What we've tested is the strategy, but also the, it, it's not about, you can't disregard the results here. That would be a mistake to say, these results don't apply to me because I'm a good intubator. Um, the, if you're a good intubator, then you certainly try your, your hardest to ensure that the intubation does not interfere with the basics of cardiac arrest. But we've done a, a lot of trials that have, t have shown that one of the big problems of, in, of interventions that we provide in cardiac arrest is that they distract us from the things that work. And so we just need to be very careful that what we do is, is not, say, not undermining chest compressions, not undermining defibrillation. 
Uh, for my personal practice, I mean, I, I'm completely happy to run a cardiac arrest on an eye gel. I don't, I don't think, if the eye gel works, I'm completely content with that. And I, and I don't, I don't, and I think that's true for anybody. So whether you're the you know, critical care team, critical care paramedic, uh, the greatest doctor on earth, uh, if an eye gel is well seated and is providing ventilation, then I don't believe that there is any, there are any requirement to change to a tracheal tube. Um, because we know the outcomes are as, as good with an, with an eye gel. Um, and I am concerned about some of the risks associated with intubation. Jerry, do you want to add Just to, and I've jotted down two quick things to add. So, so the issue around the skill of the intubator, you have to look at the CAM trial, which is very interesting, because that was done by the, in the French and Belgian systems with highly experienced pre-hospital physicians doing you know, intubations and bag masks, identical outcomes. So, so that really kind of addresses that, that point, I think. So there's no evidence that even in really highly skilled people it, it, it um, increases survival. The other thing to add to Jonathan's comment about the potential for trauma or downsides of intubation, it's interesting in the PARC trial, I can't remember if you, if you pointed this out, Jonathan, they had a pneumothorax rate in the, in the PARC trial that was 7% in the intubation arm and 3.5% in the laryngeal tube arm which is really very, you know, double, double the pneumothorax rate. Very interesting. Implication possibly very high airway pressures leading to pneumothorax once the patient's tube. And as Jonathan says, the superglottic airway device will actually sort of um, uh, pressure relieve, if you like, with very high intrathoracic pressures. So that could be one of the expl explanations. Yeah, and in fact, in the, in the CAM trial, the, the success rate was higher in the intubation group than the basic airway management group. Um, so, you know, as Jerry, as Jerry said, the, the, the CAM trial is, from that perspective, is, is the 98, 99% successful intubations, but still no better than basic airway management. Yes, just wait for the mic, please. Have you got uh, a mic? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, great. Yeah. Just, behind you. <laughs> uh, good morning. John Black, Medical Director, South Central Ambulance Service. Th thank you very much, Jonathan, for uh, a first-class presentation, and congratulations to the whole team for this opportunity for us all to reflect on airway practice. One specific question. I'm particularly interested in the group of patients where there was crossover uh, in both directions. And um, picking up your point about the importance of clinical judgment, professional judgment, and perhaps what a brilliant job all of our frontline staff have done. Were you able to retrospectively form a view as to whether when crossover had occurred, whether that was clinically appropriate from what you could see from the individual clinical records of individual patient management? Because for me, one of the issues that, that comes across is the importance of having flexibility in terms of airway management strategy when factoring in um, decision making for a, a specific patient in a specific clinical scenario. So I'm going to pass this to Kim. Uh, Kim is the, Kobe is the lead research paramedic and had the, uh, the um, task of reviewing a lot of the data and I think you've been looking at this specifically haven't you Kim? Yeah so um, we've got a big data set of um, where paramedics decided not to go with their um, allocated airway um, and we've got direct quotes from the paramedics about why they made those decisions so we're going to be doing a follow-on piece of work specifically looking at that and looking at their decision making and the reasons for it um, sort of anecdotally there was a lot of decision making around um, hemorrhage in the airway or vomiting in the airway and it you know not you know I haven't looked at the figures but it went either way people made those decisions to use an eye gel or to use an intubation based on that but yeah, it's a follow-up piece of work to be completed. We have a number of uh, further uh, papers to, to disseminate. So we've followed the patients up to six months, and so we'll present those outcomes. We've got uh, Liz, a health economist. Uh, we'll be doing a health economic analysis to look at some of the complexities around the health economic implications of some of this. But we've got some, some additional pieces of work, and one of them is specifically to look at what, what was going on with crossover. As Kim says, it seems to be highly related to soiling of the airway. Um, and this is a very huge, it's a huge challenging problem, um, I think, for airway management and cardiac arrest, and it's probably driving a lot of what's, what's going on. Um, so although the regurgitation and aspiration rates weren't different, where it's present, and particularly where it's in very high volumes, it sort of makes, makes for a very difficult airway management problem um, in cardiac arrest. Yes, a question here. Thanks, John. Uh, Aidan Wood, University of Northampton. Um, is there any data about when the first airway intervention in either group was done in terms of a time from the arrival of the paramedic, the trial paramedic, study paramedic? Because obviously 
Uh, Superglottic airways usually are inserted generally sooner, as you've alluded to, than the uh, tracheal tube. Uh, so the short answer is no, we didn't collect that data. Um, it would have been nice, but yeah. uh, there's only so much that you can do, really, in terms of <coughs> providing that information. I mean, I think the, I think the part trial, coupled with you know, clinical experience, would tell us that the average times to placing a superglottic airway device you know, are less than a, a tracheal tube. Um, and uh, there's indirect evidence from the database around that. But, I, um, but I, we, we didn't collect that data specifically. Quite, quite difficult to collect, I should imagine, yeah. anyway. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a question here. Oh, sorry. Uh, you oh, and then and then the, no, the, and then and then the guy behind you. But yes, who, um, tell us who you are, please. Thanks. Thank you. Um, my name is Matt Bailey. I'm a paramedic with SWAST. Um, sort of somewhat in relation to last gentleman's question, and I think you've covered a little bit of it. Do you think we'll ever see a trial that covers a delayed ventilation strategy uh, alongside others? Um, to sort of cover the uh, not ventilating early in cardiac arrest. Uh, Jerry, do you want to come in on the evidence or not? To some extent, I may pick that up as I, as I present my slides after the lunch break because the continuous compression trial, if I remember rightly, in effect, did continuous compressions for a period of time before they intervened, did their early management. So some studies are already out there but have failed to show benefit. And there's certainly your observational data from the United States where they've used that strategy of just inserting an oropharyngeal airway with a, with a standard Hudson mask and doing you know, perhaps three minutes of just compressions and nothing else. So there, there haven't been high quality randomized trials looking specifically at that intervention, but there's certainly observational data suggesting maybe benefit. But that, that's further work. That's another RCT. <laughs> Yeah, another RCT, great. Just a question. Hi, I'm Jamie Miles, research paramedic for Yorkshire. Uh, I just wondered uh, whether there was any lessons learnt from conducting such a large cluster randomised controlled trial uh, that could be taken forward to the design of future trials pre hospitally. Oh, yeah. Um, I think a lot of the research paramedics <coughs> in the room would, would um, say that we needed more resources aimed at the pre-hospital data collection because it was a massive trial. They had to collect huge amounts of data and they had to work incredibly hard to do that. And um, I think, could we agree that we probably should have allocated more resource to that? Yeah, we had to shift resource specifically to support the paramedics in collecting that data. Um, so I agree that that is a, an issue. I mean, data infrastructure is, needs to be developed in the ambulance services in general for clinical and research and audit purposes. Um, I think one of the key things that we learned was <clears throat> um, in order to collect all the follow-up data that um, actually the, the early work that we did to engage with our hospital staff and to engage with the research nurses was really beneficial. Um, even research nurses like a pen um, and, uh, and, and you know, actually, actually some of that work really paid off in terms of getting a really great follow-up rate. Um, I also think that some of the other <clears throat> lessons that we've learned <clears throat> and maybe benefits from participating in the trial is that it actually has uh, given people some opportunity, it's raised the profile of pre-hospital research, it's been something that, you know, because it is such a large um, a large study, um, the biggest one internationally, um, I'm surprised Jonathan didn't mention that, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that actually it, it's got people talking in the UK um, about pre-hospital research and, and people thinking about how they can get engaged and get involved, so I think that's been one of the, the lessons and the benefits really. Yeah, I think it's a very good question because obviously with now three very large independent NHR funded ambulance trials in this country, we've learnt a lot, not just the science of, you know, answering the research question, but around the infrastructure issues, around the training issues, around issues around consent in, in the vulnerable populations we're going to, the human factor stuff, and Helen Pocock, I'm just going to embarrass you, of course published a paper on the human factors uh, of the original paramedic trial. Uh, Jonathan, I think, did you publish some, some qualitative work from Revive? Yes, and uh, Kim's leading a further qualitative piece yeah. of work from, uh, from Airways yeah, too. Yeah. So, so, there's, there's, so we're, we're learning a lot, uh, and there is something about how we bring all this together at some point, uh, you know, uh, for, for, from all the sort of uh, people involved in ambulance uh, trials in particular, so that we can get even better at it, because I think we're pretty fab at it as a country now because of the experience we've all had. But there's so much we could learn uh, that would help make these more efficient, because I know the government, um, the funders are very keen on efficient trials. Uh, but also, you know, if you're out there looking after the patients, uh, 
uh, uh, making it actually easier as this becomes more and more part of the day job, as it is going to be part of the day job of all health professionals. Yeah. Research is part of the NHS. Brilliant. So I'm just, the, okay, we've got probably one final question here, and then I think it's probably lunchtime, is it? Is yes, that you? Yeah, okay, it is. There. So we've just got a microphone here. Uh, I'm Jess, a paramedic from Yorkshire. I might have maybe misinterpreted something slightly. I'm just a little bit curious. On some occasions when you said for the, those paramedics who were involved in the trial as tube first, you've mentioned that sometimes depending on patient presentation, they've maybe gone for the eye gel before the tube. Does that mean that some of the um, ambulance services that were involved actually had access to eye gels prior to the trial? Uh, yes, in fact, I think three of the ambulance services were using eye gels. Okay, because obviously receiving. from Yorkshire we didn't have access to eye gels yeah. prior to the yeah, trial. You, you were the fourth. You were the fourth so ambulance the, service. Uh, yeah. So those who were on tubes only had the option of tubes, and those on, you know, apart oh, no, from LMAs. The, well, yes, I mean, so. I so mean, we didn't have the option for maybe going between the two. The ambulance routinely. services have worked their way through various uh, um, superglottic area devices. So I mean, most ambulance services have used superglottics for a while now. Um, but they're not necessarily the eye gel. I mean, obviously, there are a range of superglottic airway devices yeah. available. Um, the, I mean, in, from a research perspective, once you're randomised to the arm, that's where your outcome is counted, regardless of what actually happens. You know, and that's what makes a reliable trial. So it's what's called intention, intention to treat analysis, which means that you're, you're analysing the group to which you were assigned, even if you didn't get the treatment to which you were allocated. Uh, and that makes for a more pragmatic uh, study that can be applied to the real world. But some of the analyses that I've described a bit further down that kind of flow chart start to look at what, what happens when patients actually get one or the other. Uh, and you're right, I think the, it's quite a messy environment in terms of, you know, there are different things were happening. And so we recorded uh, a lot of sequence of airway interventions, some of which were quite long and quite complex. Um, and, I, and I think one of the things that, that, that suggests, again, is this, this issue that if the airway is readily and swiftly managed, then you can move on to other things. If the airway is difficult, then it can become very distracting from the rest of the patient's management. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to draw this to a close. There's, there's two things for me here, then. One is um, nothing changes until the guidelines change, I think. Uh, and, the, and Jerry's going to talk to us after lunch about guidelines and probably a bit about that process. And yes, I will. Yeah, yes, no, and, and, and so uh, I won't yeah, go and Please continue to follow your uh, Ambulance Trust yes. Services guidelines for airway management. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and the second thing, really, just as we close this session, is just to congratulate Jonathan and the whole team because this is a fantastic piece of science. It's going to be really, really important uh, for our patients, and that's why we'd, all these things are being done. Uh, and um, we look forward to working out what it all means after lunch, uh, probably a bit later. Uh, but anyway, so enjoy your lunch, but please uh, thank these guys. Thanks.